Nice. This is Weaving the World Ops on Wednesday, December 1st, 2021. It's the first day of December. Woohoo! Uh, last month of 2021 and the last two years have been this strange blur of pandemic. Um, so, um, so if you keep uh, matter most open, you can usually find uh, your chats pretty easily. Is that making more sense? It does, yes. So you download it from uh, from a Play Store, an Apple Store, or... uh, either the either the Apple Store or Matter. I think Mattermost.com. Let me check. Boop boop boop. Let me go to Mattermost and see if there's a download here spot on their website and pass you that link. Okay. Mattermost.com should be. Free trial, contact sales. Oh, you've already got an account. Yeah. Um, so platform, product overview, security, try matter most now. Uh, that's interesting. They don't say, hey, here's the app. Stay aligned, design, contribute, developers, pricing, solutions. Use cases, industries. That's all about how to use Mattermost. Channels, playbooks, boards, product overview. They do not make it simple to find the app on the website. No, it's download Mattermost mobile yeah. and download apps. Oh, there we go. Did you, are you, so you're finding them better by just searching for download Mattermost? Yeah. So this it's is terrible website design that downloading mm -hmm. the app is not easy. So yes, download Mattermost mobile and desktop apps. So install the desktop app on your Mac. Yep. That's the one to do. Because I the, the desktop app is nice. Um, the iPad app is nice too. And uh, I often use, I often get into it from my uh, iPad and all of them synchronize. So when you've read a thread, uh, it keeps it good. So here's Mac OS download install guide, et cetera. So you found the mattermost.com download page, right? I did, yeah. Great, so you're all set. Okay, terrific, great. Um, and then, and then uh, Stacy and I were talking about, she's going to be helping be sort of uh, uh, operations organizer, um, um, I guess sort of Jerry Wrangler, Stacy, is that is that like a, a Jerry Wrangler? I like bad that thing to say. <laughs> I mean, I'm like I'm like that's actually good language because because I'm I'm quirky and uh, just trying to help me find my way through all the different things that need to get done uh, to to start this up. So we we were starting that conversation, uh, which will continue. And Stacy, I want to make sure I've got your um, your texting info. So why don't I give you my num my tech my phone number in the chat? Uh, there's my phone number. If you want to send me a text, I will reply, and then we will have that set up. Okay, I'm going to do that when I get off the phone because right now I'm on the phone. Sounds great. Sounds totally great. Um, and then um, so right now there's kind of a couple of things that I keep uh, bonking against to get. Uh, an issue set up. I had a nice call with Pete yesterday and we wrestled about a couple things as we sometimes have different opinions about which piece to do and where to go. Um, the thing I'm trying, I think top priority right now is to take the, that, uh, the Thursday call where we talked about the metaverse it was a really lovely call. And what I'd like to do is take a piece of that call I don't know exactly which piece yet, I haven't listened to the call yet again and that's gonna take a little time but I wanted to take a segment, like a 15 minute segment of that call and treat that as an episode of Weaving the World. Um, and, that and, and what that means then is um, I have to record an intro and an outro of some sort, uh, which is podcast smelling, right? Which says, hey, welcome to the Weaving the World podcast. I'm Jerry Mikulski. Here's our website, whatever. Here's what we're doing. Um, I have to record those. Uh, we then have to stitch those things together Pete is creating um, some software that will create a, a, a website, a page where the episode, so a page for each episode of the podcast, right? Um, there's already um, weavingtheworld.org is a little website that I'm building on Google Sites, 
which I happen to really like to use. It's very, very simple. It's secure. Um, I, um, I tried to love uh, WordPress for 15 years and fell out of love constantly. And, and so I, I've given up entirely on WordPress. At one, so my old website, uh, therexpedition.com was on WordPress and I had hired a web mistress to go build it out. And she used some of her custom code to do it. And then she changed her rates because she got popular and she needed a retainer. And, I, and her, 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 her monthly retainer was higher than what I planned to spend with her. So I was like, oops, can't do that. And then somebody attacked my website and I ended up having to pay more for a company called Sukuri, which I hope is a good security website for, for uh, WordPress blogs. I ended up paying more for Sukuri to secure my damned WordPress site than I was paying to host it. And I was like, this is just freaking ridiculous. So finally, and, and finally, it got, it got attacked again. And somehow I couldn't even log back in to the WordPress site. Couldn't figure it out. It wasn't working. And it, it wasn't like I was going to get a lot of support from WordPress. So I gave up and I deprecated it. And I rebuilt the site. You know, uh, the Rexpedition now lives in a Google site as a, as a, pale, um, a pale gesture of its former glory. But, you know, but I'm not really doing Rex anymore. Uh, and I need to figure that out. Um, so anyway, a long story to say that that uh, Google Sites has not failed me. It's very simple. It doesn't do complicated things, but it does a lot of a lot of things really well, um, including it integrates beautifully with all Google products. So you can embed a map, a spreadsheet, a doc, uh, you know, other kinds of things into Google Sites very simply and elegantly, and that's that works very nicely. So happy about that. And and the plan here is to take the simple. Uh, website that I've started and point uh, point to pages that Pete will set up for each episode of the podcast, uh, yeah. so that so that they show up on the website. And it, it might be that the pages exist on Google Sites and that we're embedding code that uh, Pete creates. And and Stacy, embedding just means that instead of Pete generating what looks like an entire web page, Pete will generate the contents of a web page and then we'll put it in angled brackets, basically. Uh, we'll put a link to that, whatever Pete generates automatically, we'll put that in angled brackets uh, on a page in the Google site. And uh, that, that will then automatically go suck in whatever content Pete has, has formatted and created and make it pretty and make it look like the rest of the website. So that, that's probably what we're doing. Um, and, and the page for each episode needs to have a link to play the, the full episode as a video podcast, it needs to have the transcript of the call. Uh, and because I've taken on the challenge of also doing an audio podcast, it should probably also have either a link to an audio podcast separate page or probably not, uh, or just a play, you know, play the audio podcast right here kind of button. We, and if you've, I'm, I'm sure you've seen on podcasts, there's like a link with a, what looks like a little bar of sound of little, you know, right. Uh, yes. frequent, frequency waves for the sound. So click here and it'll, and it'll actually play the podcast and you can scroll back and forth and so forth. Um, and that's kind of a baseline for each episode. Uh, Pete and I got a little stuck just on the transcript part. Um, there's a small complication in that for the Thursday calls until now we've been using uh, Collective Next's slightly better um, account on Zoom which automatically creates a transcript by using otter.ai. And otter is a, otter, otter is a really nice uh, speech to text system. And when it's embedded inside of Zoom, you get speaker identification because each speaker is logged in. So now the system knows that Hank is Hank and, and I'm me and you're you, Stacy. Uh, and so the transcript shows up pretty reasonably out of that um, system. Problem is uh, the calendar invite that they, that Hank's, Hank, the other Hank, um, set up, Hank Nelson from uh, Collective Next set up for those calls runs out with this Thursday's call. So tomorrow is the last one of those that they set up. And I talked with Pete and we're like, do I, do I ping them back and say, hey, could you extend it? Or do we just switch to, to my regular Zoom, which is what we're in right now? And Pete was like, let's switch to the regular Zoom but we're losing this added feature, which for a moment, it looked like we could add to my account for five more bucks a month because I'm a Zoom Pro user right now. 
And for five bucks more, you become a Zoom business user, except for the small print at the bottom of the pricing sheet that says minimum 10 accounts. So, so minimum $200 a month instead of $20 a month. And we're like, oops, not happening. No, no. So, so going to, you know, so the bump up to Otter plus Zoom by ourselves, not happening. Um, and I think just, you know, we'll, we'll figure it a different way. Um, and then Pete and I started using a, a system called Descript, uh, which Pete uh, turned me on to a while ago. And Descript is an app that lets you edit podcasts in a really brilliant way. Uh, so what happens is that you, you drop uh, an audio and, vid and or video recording into Descript and it automatically creates a transcript, I think using Otter's technology but it doesn't know to identify the speakers because it doesn't know who was on what track or anything like that. It sort of does identify speaker voices. So once you identify, oh, whenever this voice speaks, it's Hank. And whenever this voice speaks, it's Stacy. In principle, it can sort that out through the entire conversation because it'll know by the tone of voice or whatever, who each person was, but we haven't gotten that far. And partly what happened was, um, I started trying to process and, and correct the transcript, which required a lot of editing just to get to a clean transcript. There was a lot of work to do. And Descript on my machine was grinding to a halt. Like, like my machine was, was unable to cope. And it was, it, was, it was kind of comical where I would click on a word, double click on a word in the transcript in Descript, which is its own app you install. And we'd have to wait 20 seconds until something popped up that said, oh, you wanna edit that? And we were like, oh my God, this is clearly not going to work. Um, so as part of that, I pinged Jim Rutt to see if it was okay to use some of the funds that he granted to OGM to buy a new machine. So I've ordered a, a better MacBook, which should be arriving by December 8th, which is fabulous. It's a, it's a, a needed upgrade, which will not only let me sort of edit stuff better, but also, and more importantly, I've wanted to play with how I show up in Zoom in particular, but online in general um, with my brain. And so there's a bunch of apps called virtual cams or webcams uh, that you can, you can use. It's software that sits between, there's a camera embedded in my MacBook here uh, and I'm currently pointed straight at the camera, but what virtual cams do is you point to the software, which then lets you do something with the image, which then sends it to the camera, right? And one of them, an older one is called ManyCam, but there's a guy I know named Phil Libin, who was the CEO of Evernote for a while. That's why I know him. And he's founded a company called mm -hmm, which now is charging a monthly fee, but I was on their early beta. And mm -hmm is a very elegant uh, virtual cam. Like it's really nice. And it lets you do things like I could, I could min within my little window, on a Zoom call, I could minimize my head and put it anywhere. I could I could put a background and animation or whatever. And then I could take my brain and screen share my brain and make it large or whatever. I could mess around with that really nicely just while on anybody's call, right? So mm -hmm, is, is a virtual camera? Yes. Wow. So there's no hardware, it's just software. And you pay them, you, they have a monthly subscription fee. And I don't know what it is right now. I'm hoping it's under like 10 or 15 bucks because uh, these things add up. Um, but my goal here is to experiment with what, you know, uh, the place I'm trying to head is what does an OGM conversation look like between several different people who are using several different technologies. I happen to be addicted to the brain. Uh, Gene Bellinger is a black belt in Kumu, et cetera, et cetera. What does a conversation among different tool users look like? And in that case, I'm not interested in how I'm trapped in this little rectangle, but I'm really interested in some new space that we can you know, talk to each other through and with. And that's still out on the horizon, unfortunately, after almost two years of, of uh, OGMing. Um, uh, so, so the voice ID thing, uh, so Stacy, the voice ID thing might actually be something we can collaborate on. I might also, need to outsource the transcription cleanup to just someone somewhere who's really good and really fast at that and does it somewhere, you know, does it offline uh, and we sort of don't care where in the world they are. But I may need to find somebody who's, who's like really good at that. Uh, because for example, when I go to, uh, here, let me just find a, a tab. Oops. Here's one of Jim Rutt's uh, shows. This is a transcript of him talking to Daniel uh, Schmachtenberger, 
let me put the link in the chat. This is a chat of, uh, of him uh, talking to, oh good, eight, $8.33 a month. Thanks, Hank. Uh, that's Looks great. Looks interesting, looks great. Yeah, it's, it's quite powerful. There's another one called Galactic Camera, which my friend John Borthwick apparently helped fund because he runs Betaworks out of New York. And so I installed it and it, it was just ridiculous looking. I didn't look, I didn't like it at all. So I uninstalled it, I got rid of it. Um, many cam is the older one. I haven't seen what they're up to now. I should, I should go take a look, but everything I've seen about mm -hmm looks pretty professional and I like a lot. So yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah. So, so you'll see that on the, the episode page for the Jim Rutt show, um, there's a really nice transcript, like, like the ante in this game. I think that the baseline is a nice transcript. Um, and so, so, Pete and I are trying to get to the point where we can automate as much of that process as possible so that there is a web page for every episode with a nice transcript, with a pointer to where the video lives, with a pointer to where the audio lives. And then the audio and the video each need to have an intro and an outro attached to them, edited in. And then the question is how much to edit the calls. And I'm trying to do this with minimal editing of the calls because any, yeah. the moment you start getting into heavy editing, the moment you get into heavy editing, you are talking about uh, time and money uh, because uh, because these are temporal media and you have to listen to them and you have to edit and you have to listen to them again. And, you, and, and somebody's going to have to use a whole bunch of time to, to do the good editing. Yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to keep the editing either automated or minimal. Um, Descript has a really cute feature where it automatically detects ums and coughs and long pauses. And you can press a button and it'll highlight them all. And then you can press another button and it'll get rid of them all, right? Nice. So, so Descript has a bunch of really magical features that make it a really, a particularly good editing uh, program. Uh, one of which is once it's done its transcript, you can highlight words in the transcript, remove them or move yeah. them. And it'll move that clip of audio or video around. So when you output the finished produced podcast ep episode, all the edits you did to the text are actually done in the video, which is like, whoa, what? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, that, so that's quite brilliant as well. Um, so I'm hoping that with a faster machine, I, I think Descript has an M1 Mac version. And Stacy, the M1 is the new chip that Apple just um, uh, basically, they, uh, until, until this, these last two generations of MacBook, uh, Apple was using Intel chips for their MacBooks. And the one that I'm sitting here in front of has an Intel chip. Apple then took the chip design in-house, designed the M1 chip, and now the M1 Plus, I think it's called, uh, which is on the newest MacBooks, which is like three times faster. And yes, I've seen all your excitement. I've, I've been listening to you guys and watching your eyes light up at the thought has, of- And has more battery life. It's like insane what they've done. Uh, exactly. And, and so I'm thrilled to be getting this. I'm, but the problem is with a new chip for software to run quickly on it, it has to be rewritten for the new chip, right? It has to run native. Otherwise you run it in an emulator called Rosetta, like the Rosetta Stone to translate. So uh, Stacy, an emulator means uh, it's software that pretends to be some other hardware, right? So, so the M1 has an emulator called Rosetta that pretends to be an Intel Mac so that you can still run software that only runs on Intel Macs. And I, I pinged the brain and they said, we don't have a native version for the M1, but it runs just fine in Rosetta. So that's where I'm heading, right? Um, all of which to say that there's some mix of automation and humans that will turn into a finished podcast and a transcript and a page and all of that. And Pete and I have been wrestling to try to get to the point where we have that. And we're kind of close, but not, not there yet. And two months have already run by, like it is the first day of December. And I kind of had October and November to stand up some, some podcast episodes. So I'm actually behind the schedule at this point. Um, um, and, and then a bunch of other things have happened in the meantime, which I'll also get to, but, um, but once we've got that, that starting point that I've just described, that's when things get OGME and get interesting. So Pete took that Thursday call and he craved it. We have the, we have a project craved 
where he basically took it and deconstructed it and started baking it into, into the uh, massive wiki and uh, linking it up and a whole bunch of other really interesting things, all of which are beyond the scope of this initial phase of, of what I'm trying to get done kind of automatically to any new podcast episode. Um, so, uh, so the conceit of weaving the world is that we have episodes and then we have shadow episodes or behind or, or the making of episodes or composting episodes, or we're still working. I'm still not happy with any of the language around it necessarily. I don't have a real favorite, um, but there are other episodes where we look at the content of the first of the, of the episode and then weave it into the world, into the, into the big fungus. Um, and that means using different kinds of tools to map the logic and the ideas and the articles that it came from, which I already do in my brain sort of by default, you know, so, so I'm already doing this part. I'm looking for other people interested in doing it with other tools. And I'm interested in the conversation between us and any other interested party in deepening the ideas and then representing them in some way and putting all of those different representations into the comments. And that might mean that at the end of the episode page, there's a, oh, and this is what happened in the, in the composting show. And then it's just a bunch of links to uh, uh, a map, you know, a mind jet, a mind map that somebody creates or a Miro board that somebody writes for that episode or for a series of episodes around the same theme. That's really cool because we want, we want to have continuity and flow. We're, we're actually looking for a shared memory um, that, that, that um, is, is actually useful. Like we're, we're not, we're not, I'm, I'm not trying to stand this up because it's an interesting exercise. I'm trying to stand this up on the hypothesis that <clears throat> some of us will hit on some really, really interesting ways of representing stuff. Hey Pete, I was just explaining our, our um, uh, you are locally muted, but I think on purpose. Yes, good. Um, good, he'll be back. Uh, so, um, so, so once we have a default episode, then we book a, a follow-up episode where we can use the, the transcript and then start doing some weaving into the big fungus, which I don't know what it's going to look like. I know what my little piece is going to look like because I'm a brain black belt and I, and I, you know, I, I, and I, and I'm busy using the brain in a way that heads toward what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to edit, curate, and craft my brain so that it's a useful artifact in that particular way, um, which doesn't mean changing my behavior that much, but it means interesting ways of thinking about how I create thoughts and what I connect up. So, so there's been that, con that, that conversation we've been having um, about investing and telling your kids, you know, teaching your kids about investing and all that. Um, and when I see that, and there's also the, the other conversation about nuclear fission and nuclear power and all that. And I see those conversations on, on a mailing list that's private and I cry a bit because when I see good ideas go by on a private mailing list, I'm like, wow, those, those are really interesting things are going into the bit bucket because nobody's ever going to look them up again. And, and if they were really good thoughts and they were clear, they ought to be curated or gardened into someplace that's public facing, that's available to, to, to everybody else. Uh, hence the big fungus and some attempt to make it visible. So Pete, um, I was just telling the sort of the, full, the fuller story of what you and I are trying to create through some automation and some human intervention um, uh, to, to stand up separate pages for episodes of Weaving the World and what, my, what would be on the pages. I talked about the script. I talked about um, virtual cams. I uh, mentioned that I've ordered a new Mac that should be coming by the 8th. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and Stacy and I have talked about her assisting me as an ops person and we're on board. Uh, we're going to, you know, continue closing that and Stacy's on the road for, uh, what could be three weeks, but basically as of tomorrow night, we'll be in a place where she's as good as being at home because she'll be in a, <clears throat> in a stable spot, not, you know, not working out of cafes or, or doing a high wire act on the road. Um, so that's kind of where we are. And I've been talking most of the call describing all these things so I should stop for a little bit and see what questions uh, Stacy and Hank and you have. Well I texted you Jerry so you'll see if my text came through. Cool let me go check. Um, 
Perfect. All of these thoughts on the on the the mailing lists, like the th the threads uh, that you just mentioned, uh, can't they go on an OGM website uh, uh, somewhere beyond Mattermost? Um, can't they be made available to people who Google uh, the future of the uh, of the nuclear energy or, or stuff like that? So yes and no. I mean, the, the Google group is intentionally private so that we can manage who's there to kind of minimize trolls and all yeah. of that. Um, but there's this implied assumption that the conversation is private because it's a private mailing list, which we would be breaking by, by publicizing these sorts of things in a sense. So there's, there, there's that. Is yeah, it yeah. really private? Or um, can people see it through Google somehow? Um, I, it's private to join, but I think it's visible in Google groups. So if you were to search for it, you'd find it. If you were not a member, I think you could find it. And I think a non-member could read. Uh, the th Are you opening an incog incognito window to see if you can get to it? I am. And the first thing I have to do if I go to groups.google.com is sign in with my Google account. <laughs> so. Right, exactly. But don't you have like 100? Uh, I only have a few. OK. Um, cause you could sign in with any other one that doesn't have, that's not on yeah, the list. Right. I could. And that would have maybe, the same maybe effect. Maybe I will. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so Hank, to answer your question, um, I wouldn't want the raw conversation as it showed up on yeah. a mailing list to go straight into this artifact that I'm talking about. I was actually sitting in the shower, like an hour ago, I was sitting thinking, oh, okay. So one question would be, um, uh, one question would be uh, an assertion in this in the mind map, and for me, I was thinking about my brain. I need to add a thought that says, "Hey, uh, forget about stock picking. Uh, ETFs are the way to go because someone else does all the work of, of averaging, and these things tend to play out, you know, pretty well. Look at look at some history, and that that would be one investment approach. And then there'd be a thought above it called investment strategies." And I've got something like that. I've got investment advice for sure. I've got a whole bunch of stuff in there, but I haven't organized it into a series of investment strategies. And I certainly haven't organized it into investment strategies understandable by a, a teen or a, a, or a young person, right? A younger person, um, which is kind of the goal here. And so, and so the wisdom that came by about investing would be super interesting for me personally to curate into the brain as that series of logic steps. And then, hey, if you're if you're on this investment advice, here's some ETFs that somebody recommended that are real, that we think are pretty stable and pretty good right now. Blah 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 would be interesting under that. And then yeah. there would be a, a, there'd be a different approach that says, oh my gosh, you have to take some money and put it into crypto. And then that's its own huge conversation, et cetera. And then in some other part of my brain, there's already you know conversations about the viability of nuclear fuel, nuclear energy, as we're trying to green the economy. Um, I uh, you know and I, and I'm I've got a bunch of things that Amory Lovins has been saying on a different, more scientific list, which are brilliant about, about, and he's like pretty heavily against nuclear fuel, uh, nuclear energy. And I was sort of reading our lists going, oh, okay. So we're, you know, a couple of people are being convinced that nuclear needs to be part of the mix, but I don't know enough to bridge that gap and make it visible as an interesting argument that addresses the questions instead of making blanket statements, right? And so, and so I don't really want to cut and paste just the conversations from the mailing list. I want to take those as feedstock for a different composting conversation about, oh, okay, what's the logic of how to organize this? And how does it show up in a way that is useful uh, to a newbie coming in and trying to do this? Yeah, I'm just on the OGM website and Aside from uh, three videos and a, and a few links, there's not much there. That's correct. Wouldn't it be interesting to sort of at least have a list of the different threads so that people might be stimulated? Oh, if OGM is talking about these type of things, uh, it, it could be very useful to me. Try uh, a different website, uh, Hank, uh, wiki.openglobalmind.com. Which, which isn't going to satisfy you, but it, it, it will at least point you. And it'll give you, it'll give you more, more depth because that's the OGM wiki. Wiki.globalmind.com? Wiki. Um, Wiki.openglobalmind.com. Wiki. So the same website, but wiki.infront. Yeah. Dot in front. yeah.
Just put wiki as the high level identifier. And then click all pages when you get there. And the, the base wiki, the base OGM website is really simple because we're using a very simple site builder um, that's pointed to some markdown files. And the site builder doesn't have a lot of uh, bells and whistles on it. So it so the page is that's, that's, really simple. Well, well he, we don't we don't have like a nav menu. Yeah, uh, uh, well, right? Hank, Hank said you don't have a lot of content here. Well, that too, but kind of intentionally. There's no like. It would be easy to make yeah. a readme. the The homepage could have links to everything. Could so, be a lot longer. Right? The, the reason cool. the reason that website is small is because the intent is that's kind of an you know the the advertising marketing site, and then one of the big links there should be to the wiki. Yeah. Probably. And the wiki is where everybody edits it instead of you know a, a few people. Have a marketing presence for Open Global Mind. To to use a phrase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the mailing list is not public. Uh, although, interestingly, if you search for Open Global Mind, all one word, uh, you do see some references in the Piragaji list and the Kiko Lab Meme Factory list. Interesting. In, in Google groups. Okay, so I thought when I set it up that I'd set it to be public, but but membership only. Uh, it appears to be private. I will go back and look at it. And well, which may be what, what we want. Though. Yeah, exactly. That, uh, that, that's still an interesting yeah. question. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and partly I'm in my lifetime online, which feels lengthy now, um, I've seen way too many super brilliant things said in private conversations that have disappeared, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm extremely interested in, in um, in the act of curating them so that they survive and live in a more concise, organized space, whatever that means. Yeah. Right. Um, so, and and I have a slightly different mission, uh, which is less about organization, although I think organization is important, and more about promiscuity. <laughs> right. So. Um, Massive Wiki is uh, one of the things Massive Wiki is built to do is to make information float away, kind of, um, and recombine and and um, and do interesting things. Be fruitful and multiply, as well as also being able to be um, organized and look like a, a real website, and, and, um, real uh, you know, real content. Um, I I have to. Um, on behalf of our good friend, Mr. Arena, I have to also say that there is an OGM homepage on, on uh, Trove. On Trove. And there are links to the Arena pages for member list. We're, we're basically from that simple homepage, we're actually pointing over uh, to Trove for three different links, right? A calendar, member list, and affiliated projects, something like that? Something like that. Yeah. And which, which is good in the sense of what OGM wants to be and is trying to be, which is like, how do we distribute our presence? How do we use? Uh, it's also kind of nice in terms of what uh, Jordan and Lionsberg are trying to do with this flotilla of entities, which is how do we use and combine the superpowers of each different entity to create something sort of more powerful together? Um, cool. Um, and then, and then Pete's Pete's tendency toward promiscuity, a sentence I enjoy saying, um, uh, is very different from my tendency toward curation. Um, and I think the two are good combinations together. I think that 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 energy, like these are polarities to manage; these are not opposites to resolve. Uh, and you only get to good curation with a lot of promiscuity. But my my feeling is, without really good curation somewhere, it just turns into a jungle overnight. It's like the yard left for a little too long on its own. Uh, we had when we lived in San Francisco, we had a, a yard for a while that was overrun with blackberries, <clears throat> and several times we tried pulling the vines and doing it. it's like really painful, stupid work. Uh, and then they like blackberries are the cockroaches of the plant kingdom. They just keep coming back and survive almost anything until we finally took like drastic measures and got rid of them. But uh, uh, they were haunting us for a long time. Um, there was also this tree in the middle of the yard at the beginning, which it turns out, uh, I think it's called something like a Gabriel's horn, I'm forgetting now, but it only has a scent at night. 
and it mm. had these it had these beautiful big blooms that that hang, that hung downward. Uh, they were beautiful, but you step on the terrace at night, and it would be like somebody who sprayed perfume outside. It was a de really delightful smell, but the tree filled the whole little backyard. Um, and then during the day, no scent at all. It was really cool. So it was clearly looking for nocturnal insects, I guess. Um, so, so Stacy, the place that I paused my description was, oh, and by the way, I said in front of myself to also have an audio podcast for Weaving the World, which then means going to another tool like Anchor or Blueberry or something else. I'm, I'm, my preference is toward Anchor just because I've used it a little bit before and I have it installed, but I was looking at other, other tools and I wasn't convinced by any of them actually. Uh, Pete, I, I'm wondering if there's a like somebody who's done a brilliant summary and has like better better recommendations than I was able to find. Um, but that also means taking the audio portion of the podcast and then creating with that an audio podcast that plays nicely, that that looks good. And and one of the nice things about Anchor is that it does soup to nuts. You can start recording. You can record an episode in Anchor. You can invite guests in and record their voices and blend them in. You can add sound effects, you can edit the resulting piece, you can string together a bunch of stuff, you can then publish it and you can send it all the way to iTunes podcasts or some other kinds of podcast hosting uh, with a little icon that says, this is the, the pretty cover of my, of my podcast and all of that seems to really work. There we go. It's hallucinogenic if you need it. Really? Damn it. Missed that, missed that march, huh? <laughs> Linked to me, I, I I thought it was like deadly, like you don't like don't eat this, but uh, hallucinogenic is interesting. Cool, thanks. Um, so um, I I, I uh, have to mention uh, uh, David Bovell and Wendy Elford and I, the Garden Crew, um, are uh, have have are working on a process called knowledge casting, uh, which combines a podcast. Um, uh, peer-reviewed journal, knowledge garden like a massive wiki, um, and uh, and sometimes a few other things uh, like uh, smart contracts and and uh, smart tokens. Um, and we haven't rescheduled our call. You're going to sort of do a bit of a mind meld over that, which I'd love yep. to do. Yep. Um, and if there's an overlap between these two things, then we can be knowledge gardening or knowledge casting the weaving the world calls. That's a big win. From my perspective, for sure. Um, cool. Uh, thoughts, questions, suggestions. Um, I would love to go over everything as a project with Stacy at some point. Maybe when she's a little bit more settled in the place. Settled. Sounds good. Sounds good. So, Stacy, maybe day after tomorrow when you're um, in like Friday or something when you're actually settled in one place? Yeah, or the other thing, you know, since you guys are on the West Coast, I'll, uh, I'll be all checked into the hotel by like, you know, four or five o'clock your time. And well, I'm available. And I, and I run on East Coast hours, so. Oh, you're, you're East I'm, Coast, okay. Yeah. I'm around <laughs> from like 9 a.m. To, to 6 p.m. Eastern. East Coast time. And Stacy's in North Carolina right now on a beautiful lake. So, so two things. So, Jerry, can I ping you like around five, four or five o'clock your time just for like five minute call? And then, Pete, can we anytime you want on Friday? Uh, yeah, that sounds great. You bet. Okay. Perfect. Yes, for me as well. Okay, great. Um, Pete, cool. how and, does that knowledge casting work? Uh, which which part? Uh, well, the part uh, that you're working out with uh, with uh, David and Wendy. Um, suppose in trying to uh, map the voices of Gaia, uh, we would send out. Uh, uh, requests to uh, all different communities, school classes, uh, uh, football uh, clubs, uh, amateur football clubs, uh, 
whatever all around the world. We're, we're with, doing it a little bit differently. I, I, I like the idea of just making an open call. Uh, Voicing Gaia is actually uh, facilitated. So um, uh, let me see if I can pull up uh, like an internal document here. Um, um, so the another part of I I'm I'm still a little bit. Uh, uh, David's got a much finer grain sense of of what's doing what, and he's got some several several overlapping structures which kind of all are doing similar things at different scales and different yeah. uh, different things. But uh, the idea of voicing Gaia is that um, uh, that we would actually choose uh, you know ten twenty um, communities around the world uh, and then have uh, a crew of folks that would run uh, probably in-person workshops uh, collecting uh, spoken word um, drawing stuff uh, music and then collating that into something what it, it sounds a lot like weaving the world at, at some point where it's like and all of that turns into a podcast um, uh, the the other parts of knowledge casting in general uh, include uh, so you've got workshops which are, are both fed from the knowledge commons and feed into the knowledge commons um, and uh, the knowledge commons turns into the podcast and also uh, is connected with a peer-reviewed journal um, and I think that's the the, the key parts of it uh, we've got something else uh, in in collaboration with another another uh, person in Australia. Um, uh, we're working on something called chain conferences, uh, a chain of conferences. Uh, so another destination, Voicing Gaia, and several other feeds of chain conferences are are heading towards uh, Stockholm Plus Fifty, which I think is next year. Uh, and uh, each of you know each of the podcast series, knowledge casting series, um, are both independent. Uh, and you know, if you step back far enough, they're all they're all kind of doing the same thing in different places. So, uh, Voice and Guy is is one proposal that we've got outstanding. Um, another proposal uh, we're working on right now. Um, uh, is for uh, actually a couple of them that are kind of in the pipeline. One of them is for a smart city in, in Southeast Asia, uh, smart city development in Southeast Asia. So that community would not be workshops of you know, uh, different kinds of people around the world, but it would be <laughs> workshops of architects and construction engineers and finance people and stuff like that all talking about, okay, you know, we're building this huge, we have this huge smart city project in Southeast Asia. How is that going to come together? Um, another one uh, is one that Wendy's, uh, Wendy is sourcing, uh, which is uh, water projects in Australia. Um, Australia is kind of a desert continent, uh, not unlike the American West kind of. Uh, water is a hugely important thing and there's a bunch of, organizations and conferences and uh, legal stuff, federal legal stuff, probably state legal stuff too, that um, you know, combines to, to make interesting, uh, interesting and large scale kind of water things. So another chain for uh, would be uh, a collection of, I, I guess that one, um, Wendy's got a particular um, effort she's worked with for a couple of years already. Um, with different water groups around um, a watershed in Australia. Uh, and the really interesting tension for Wendy there is there's the developed way of looking at, at a river, a big river, and the indigenous way of looking at a big river. Um, uh, she says the indigenous people look at it as source. It's a living thing. The, the river is literally a living thing. Um, in 
what I would call Western world, although I don't know how that applies to Australia, in the developed um, view of the, you know, the non-Indigenous people living and, and working and buying and selling stuff in Australia, the river is a resource. You know, you cut it up into acre feet or whatever, and you buy and sell it, and you dam it when you feel like it, and you know, it's it's a it's a resource, not source. Um, so there's that one conference that's going on. She's got a she's aiming towards a conference development workshop, etc. Uh, early to 2022. That is going to be one in a series of chamferences about water around the world. You know, uh, obviously, lots of people care about water, and and we can set up a chamference that um, works for uh, water and watersheds and legalities and indigenous rights and all that kind of stuff in different places around the world. All of that goes towards Stockholm Plus Fifty, um, along with you know, smart cities and and uh, indigenous rights and, you know, lots of stuff. Yeah. I feel like I did a poor job. Um, David, <laughs> if you're watching this in the future, I'm <laughs> sorry if I-, I It was interesting, that. I like it. Um, there's a, as, as you can tell, there's, you know, multiple shell, multiple layers of, you know, uh, the onion and, um, uh, and multiple parts of that. There's, you know, the smart contract legal stuff. There's the knowledge stuff. Uh, there's human factors and user-centered design stuff. Um, so all of that is kind of getting mixed together to do lots of different things. Um, but, you know, uh, weaving the world and knowledge casting and the other stuff that we're working on are, you know, very resonant. Could it be used in that uh, mass outreach approach that I'm interested in to contact uh, several thousand of people and communities with specific questions about um, this and this is happening in your area? What does Gaia think about it? What would Gaia say? Yep. And then weave those things together. Uh, yeah, I, I, that makes a, a lot of sense as an approach. Um, currently, something like Voice and Gaia is, is again, that, that curated is kind of a weird word, but uh, you know, as, assembled and facilitated rather than reaching out to lots of thousands. You know, we're, we're yeah. collecting and, and facilitating dozens um but obviously uh, you know it's the same the same kind of general attack yeah. the same kind of general uh human processes yeah. um wendy in particular is also um uh, she's hooked into uh dave stone's community and of course dave stone does and and um and his folks do that kind of thing where they reach out into yeah. you know a, a big space of thousands of individuals and, and groups Using, using really sophisticated sense making tools. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, well, I think it could be uh, the, the voice in Gaia could be both. Um, yep, I agree. In fact, uh, I haven't exchanged uh, any telegram messages with David for weeks, so I should really get yeah, back to him. You definitely should. And, yeah, and I'll, uh, I'll yeah. mention it on our next call, which is- today. Yeah. And I would, oh, yeah. Love, I would love to have some Weaving the World calls about water, just cut through that space and, and see what yeah. we can do there and see how that how that feeds uh, the voices of Gaia, et cetera. So yeah, that's a good idea. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine, uh, so when I lived in Manhattan and worked for Esther, I shared a flat with uh, Tamara Damon, whose mother was Betsy Damon, who was kind of a performance artist back in the heydays in Manhattan and had an act called the 5,000 year old woman uh, and then a bunch of other stuff, but she became a keeper of the waters. She designed a park on a city in inner China that's a city on a river and the river was really kind of Kind of messed up and the park she created was shaped like a fish so water would be siphoned off the river um, through the mouth of the fish and then it would go through settling ponds and the whole thing was a park you could walk across 
but it had bubbling, bubbling areas, settling ponds, other kinds of things, and to the point where the tail of the fish fed the water back into the river. And the whole thing, you know, they gave her the key to the city. And, and this was uh, 25, 30 years ago. Uh, somewhere in the middle of China, I can find the city if you want. Uh, but super, super interesting. And she was all about, you know, waters. Um, cool, Stacey. We're, I think we're about to wrap this call. Um, so Great. Ha <laughs> happy driving. Thanks for being on the call. Thanks for Thank you. jumping in to, to, to help. And we'll, we'll be in touch, as they say. Okay, looking forward. Talk to you forward. at five. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Um, cool. Anything else for right now? Um, not, not to cheapen something real with, with fiction, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Jerry, your description of the, the, the river and the fish uh, reminded me of um, a Disney uh, movie, Raya and the Last Dragon, which has uh -huh. the same kind of thing, um, dragon-shaped, though. So the, the four or five lands uh, that um, protagonist and her dragon friend have to navigate our, our provinces, essentially, or states or whatever, around collected around the shape of a dragon when you zoom out. And there it is. Look, dragon. I had, I've not seen the movie. Thank you. So I wonder, I wonder if there's some connection and, you know, some... Disney research person it's like oh, ran into the park or something. Yeah, that'd be that'd be really fun. Um, and I think I have a let me just find it. Uh, if this is let's see if the site is still there, I'll click on the link. I have kind of a, a fascination or love hate relationship with the Disney as as they stumble into cultural sensitivity and awareness. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the most amazing things I've ever heard is uh, there, you can go on YouTube. So one of the things that Disney does because it's so big and so worldwide is it translates its movies into 20 languages, you know, like that, including all the songs and stuff like that. And so it's, you can go, it's animation, so yeah, if you're lazy. So you can, you can go on YouTube and find uh, one of the theme songs. The one I happen to remember is Colors of the Wind. Um, and let's not get started on Pocahontas and and <laughs> the English, but um, but you can listen to you know somebody's put a supercut together of twenty languages, and the song runs through twenty languages a verse at a time. You know, and it's amazing. It's like you know, I I, I wish I could show that to you know somebody from two hundred years ago. Look right. look where culture has come. Yeah. And then of course you you have to explain the. I had this. This reminds me. I I probably told this story again, and I'll tell it. I probably told this story before and I've told it again. Um, African refugee, um, my wife was helping out with the African refugees who speak French. And so one of them finally got out of the, the jail um, that we keep um, refugees in and was uh, on his way to family in New York, I think. So we lived in Southern California near Disneyland. We had the opportunity to bring him to Disneyland for a day, which is like, you know, from the jungles, well, from the jungles of South America, starting from Africa and, you know, making your way to the wow. U.S. and all the weird things about the U.S. and then to bring somebody to Disneyland, that's just a normal trip. But he's obviously African-American, black-skinned, um, and I took him to the, the Song of the South uh, ride, you know, and we got to go on the ride. And I tried to start explaining the Song of the South to <laughs> Wow. somebody from africa and yeah and i couldn't really you know but it, it was um uh it was a weird thing thinking of all the cultural stuff that goes on and you know ends up in in anaheim yep yep <laughs> it's entertainment yep. and i i used to navigate the very perilous waters of the world rivers of the world on the jungle cruise ride so we yeah. enjoyed the movie yeah um, and they have the the dumb jokes and uh dwayne johnson does a good job of delivering Dwayne Johnson's an interesting character. Um, Pete, thank you for the story. That was, that was really nice. I like it. And I, I, it's ringing a bell. I think I have heard it before from you. Um, Kumandra. Uh, uh, so I, you know, this, this thing, like, like, did they do a good thing by compressing, you know, five, five or six, like, 
cultures into Kamandra? Is that a right. good thing or a bad thing, you know? And this is a whole intense conversation about cultural appropriation and misappropriation that rides there, right? And then how do you honor something without diluting it or stealing from it or whatever? Yep. Big questions. Um, can, can you even? Exactly. I remember watching Moana and at the start, I was just furious with the movie. I'm like, are you kidding me? These people know exactly about all this. And I'm like, oh, that's the plot of this movie. <laughs> but I was so angry at the start. I was like, good Lord, seriously? It's like I'm angry at Harry Potter. Like he's the stupidest wizard there ever was. Yeah. I, got, I got really tired. I got really tired of her, Hermione being like brilliant and, and yeah. Harry being like an idiot. Yeah, and all yeah. this. Why strange... is, why is hero, uh, Harry the hero and not Hermione? No idea. Should be her. Yeah, but that that's the way to get get people involved in. Of course, it. of course. That's the way that that kids are changing. That's the way that the young young girls are are saying, "Yeah, I am the hero." Look at look at those seven books or seven films. Yeah, oh, I, oh, I thought all... it was very clever to do it that way. But they're all known as the Harry, Harry Potter series. Oh yeah! Oh, I'm a very big fan of Harry. Uh, they're not the Hermione Granger series. <laughs> yeah, but that's not subversive. That can be put aside. Yeah. From, oh yeah, that's. Uh, Why isn't there a Hermione Granger series? Why isn't there like a, a sequel and a prequel and a like? I'm sure yeah. there's. I'm sure there's lots of Harry Potter fanfic, unless they've been really good about stamping it yeah. out. But anyway. Um, good. On that, on that interesting note, <laughs> thank you very, very much. This has been super useful. Yeah, and really enjoyed. See you on the inner tubes. Yes. Bye bye. Bye for now.